Hello, welcome to the third. Oh, this is the fourth now because we did the two Derrida ones, but the fourth episode in the Schmidt series, taking up Giorgio Agamben's work, Homo Soccer, uh, Sovereign Power and Bare Life by he's an Italian philosopher, very interesting guy. Um, before we jump into welcome to the third, this is the fourth now because we did the two Derrida ones, but the fourth episode in the Schmidt series. Taking up Giorgio Agamben's work. Had a slight technical error there for a second. Sorry about that. I'm back. Uh, it's pronounced soccer, actually, at least, if you take the Latin. But um, anyway, so... Before we get started into that, I'll just do a bit of boring housekeeping, but uh, ECL for next week is going to be postponed, because this is the last day of using this shitty mic and poor production, so we're looking forward to that. <laughs> so, yeah, so we'll go back to the regular show after next week. So just to jump right into the text, I'll introduce the work, and we'll go from there. So the work that we're covering in two parts, starting with today, is Giorgio Gombin's Homo Soccer. And the argument that Agamben makes in this work is that the globalized world, which is supposed to have rendered obsolete the reassertion of state sovereignty, sovereignty, sorry, has created a globalized concentration camp, and this is actually the term that he uses in the text, in which your political rights as a qualified citizen with language to speak justice or truth is always able to be stripped away from you to the level of bare life, which is something I think political dissidents in our sphere can certainly attest to. So we're going to cover the arguments of this book, in which Agamben proceeds to make the point through a study of an obscure figure of Roman law, that of the homo, homo soccer, which is a sacred individual that cannot be sacrificed, but could be killed with impunity. So the first and crucial thing to understand with this text, when Agamben gets at this in the introduction to the book is the distinction between the two Greek terms used to distinguish modes of life. The first is zoe, which corresponds to the zoological or natural reproductive life, and then the bios, which is the qualified political life or political representation, or you could think of the word biography, which has its etymolo etymological history in bios, an inscription of your life, you're under the under the law, you're inscribed within the political order. So you have the animal life, the private life, and you have the bios, the life of political representation. So this distinction for the Greeks meant that the private reproductive life and the qualified political life are qualitatively different, with Zoe as bare naked life and bios, which extracts the human from outside of Zoe, and because the human is a unique animal with language that can assert the justice or the good, this is what makes bios the qualified political life. So what the government wants to do with this distinction is argue that modernity inserts Zoe into the bios, making that distinction between the two blur. So with bios, you are a properly political subject, while with Zoe, you're just an, an individual inhabiting the zoological mode of existence. And what happens in modernity for Agamben is a zoological enters the biopolitical order, the two modes becoming blurred and indiscernible. So we become the object of power in the biopolitical. We have rights that can be withdrawn from us at any time, and we can be reduced to the level of Zoe, which is Agamben saying that this reduction to bare life under liberal democracy is a mode of totalitarianism. And Agamben loves his paradoxes here as the zoological is included into the bios by means of what he calls an exclusive inclusion. It's included in the juridical order by means of its exclusion, by its control over the zoological, by excluding it from the bios. So to get to the figure of homo soccer, the homo soccer is, like we said, that figure of Roman law that is sacred and can be killed with impunity. So the sacred is that which is con considered removed from the political order. It's in its own sphere. So homo soccer is removed from the bios and into the zoe without protection from the law and can be killed with impunity. So 
This is a further de-evolution de from Zoe, as Zoe is inscribed within the juridical order, so it still remains within that order by means of exclusion and ex exclusive exclusion, while Homo Soccer is without that order. So what Agamben means to say is that we're living this giant concentration camp with this globalized order, which is another way of talking about American unilateral order, that we could be reduced to this Homo Soccer as well, the moment that we become enemies of the state. So that's how biopolitical power is exercised in global liberal democracy. And making use of paradox, as he loves to do, he examines Schmidt's figure of sovereignty, and he sees um, he uses that the sovereign figure who has the ability to suspend the law, but nonetheless that remains legal by inscribing illegality in the law's own transgression within the law. And so he loves playing with these paradoxes to show us how these exclusive inclusions become the mode of political life under modernity and that we become excluded from leg legal protection and we risk being reduced to bare life. So that is, in a nutshell, at least the first part of the book. And that's what sets the stage for the rest of the argument. Anyway, so now that I guess the basic intro is out of the way, let's uh, turn to you, Nils. What what was your impressions of this text? Um. For, for the first part, I would say that, uh, as with most so-called postmodernist thinkers, whether they are post-structuralists or deconstructivists or what have you, um, their perspective always adds new layers of, of perception to topics and, and uh, complex matters that uh, one believes to seemingly have understood and so it's 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 always worthwhile to to read their takes on uh substantially controversial matters like this um especially when uh when when agamben uh, relies on foucault heavily in in his introduction and in the first part of, of 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 the book because usually uh people associate foucault with uh, with his with his uh, research on on the prison system and the systematics of surveillance, and of course uh, him being a homosexual, and uh, usually uh, would would probably deem him um, uh, degenerate and what have you. And uh, as we all know, our uh, rather capital C conservative friends they would uh, by by uh, knowing that he is a homosexual. Uh, believe that he has nothing worthwhile to say and uh, by by injecting uh, Foucault and his biopolitics uh, his biopolitics stick into this whole matter using him as some some sort of uh, launching pad into the whole topic I believe uh, Agamben does a great job in creating interest in Foucault's actual writings where they may not have been any beforehand and regarding the actual uh, topic and its its uh, its acuteness nowadays, I believe. I mean, the 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 book was written in in nineteen ninety five. Uh, we see the 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 European theater after the the coming down of the Berlin Wall and after the eventual collapse of uh, Soviet communism and. Uh, more or less within the beginning of new uh, humanitarian and and world police style uh, interventions uh, in on the Balkans, especially during that time, uh, I believe to a certain degree this book by uh, Agamben was also some sort of response to Alain Badiou's uh, work on ethics that was published in 1993. And, which uh, more or less brought up the topic of criticizing the U.S., the the so-called uh, or self-proclaimed guardian of freedom in in the Western world or the whole world uh, for for uh, abusing this 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 status as the sole surviving superpower for. Uh, interventions all over the place and and uh, enforcing and 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 uh, um 
forcing the, the Western ideals and Western democracy and liberalism onto people that uh, are not used to it and might not actually need or like that while treating them as some sort of uh, not so noble savage that uh, cannot handle his own business as was done multiple times on the Balkans, especially uh, after they try to, uh, those people try to sort out the, the mess that communism left them with. Um, so uh, this is very important, especially nowadays for people, I believe, who still think that some piece of paper, some constitution and some, some basic human rights or what have you might save them if some government or uh, some some extraterritorial uh, supranational uh, body decides to declare them uh, undesirables and deplorables and what have you because uh, this is not the case and um, well this this whole concentration camp metaphor might be a little strained but uh, of course, there's always this the saying of oh, if if we don't stick to our freedoms and don't fight for it, we're all gonna end up in some concentration camp or FEMA camp or gulag or sooner or later. But in fact, especially from a post-structuralist point of view, uh, within within uh, neoliberalism and hypercapitalism, we are in fact already living in some sort of uh, anti-Disneyland hellscape camp of whatever kind you may call it. And this is uh, this is one of the books I would say so far that I have read that uh, brings this whole point across uh, in, in a very distinct and also enjoyable way because as we have seen with Derrida, those those tried those tracts uh are sometimes very 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 uh boring and and uh difficult to read but with uh, a garments book here uh, this is not the case at least it was not to me yeah good comments i mean once you brought up directly there um the fact that the Gombin's responding to Elaine Bajou's text. Now you can really see the limitations of Bajou's thought specifically as you know he is still a, a Maoist and so when he's talking about uh, the victimization from the American unilateral order on these third world populations, he still keeps it in this dialectic between one oppressor and one oppressed. Rather, in Agamben's case, what he's saying, which I find far more interesting, why he's someone I think we should look to, even though he uses these kind of funny things like concentration camp is the direct line from Aristotle to Auschwitz. Yeah, he said some you know kind of funny things, but regardless, what Agamben gets at, which I think precisely with the Marxists or in Baju with the Maoists and Derrida miss, is that this very logic of exclusive inclusion by including this bare life within the political order, within law, and that allows it to leave us in this permanent state of emergency. So when he takes up Schmidt's idea of state of exception, what Agamben is saying is that we're permanently in the state of exception that by this very paradoxical logic we can always be stripped of our rights the moment we run afoul of the so-called uh, democratic state that we live under and you can see that directly with our own political dissidents and our own movement the moment that uh you know they 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 take up an action that's directly against the interests of liberal democracy uh just look at charlottesville for example how how our own people got treated there they got a uh, railroaded they didn't have proper representation you could we can go through the whole list of what happened to them and how they were treated but it's that very same logic of this permanent state of emergency which says okay we had this war on terror now we could take what we learned from the war on terror and apply it to this war on white nationalism which is something that they actually said when they declared white nationalism a terrorist threat they said okay well we learned everything we learned about fighting Islamic extremism, so now we need to apply it at home to white nationalists. And that's something we have directly witnessed. And I think Agamben gets at this more correctly than any of the Marxist critique, although he certainly is a man of the left. But I think that what he points to is far more applicable than the other critiques of American uh, use of sovereign power.
This is a very valid and important point because normal people, and uh, I include the both of us in here and probably FC too, uh, though I don't know uh, FC's professional background, but uh, normal people, quote unquote, usually don't concern themselves with matters of law, of, of the uh, uh, juridical world. And uh, I, they're usually right about that because it is very dry. It is It involves a, a, a huge amount of uh, systematic thinking. It's not exciting. Um, you have to read uh, various uh, voluptuous tomes to 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 even get basic understanding of of how those uh, difficult uh, juridical systems work. But uh, this this non concern about law, especially when it comes to political law, uh, makes people when they are forced to confront this matter, like in Charlottesville and the aftermath, uh, makes those people. Uh, confuse law with morals, and usually, this this is this is of course something that can be applied in a political way, like in in, in an election campaign when you uh, ride the the bus of uh, equality and what have you, and uh, and you try to to spin the the laws as they are in 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 being disadvantages. Uh, for certain minorities and what have you but in effect laws are just mechanisms of applying power or uh, releasing power and uh, of course of, of of spending money on this or that uh, certain privileged group and all those mechanisms are steered by actual people so the thing that must be changed in in, in such controversial uh ways are not actually the laws but the people who make the laws the lawmakers the politicians and um books like this one who look at a more or less uh, ju uh juridical or or uh a juridical matter or a matter of international law in a uh philosophical and thus more appealing way to to normies um are very important to uh, to to make people more sensitive uh to matters like this and uh, more thoughtful about what a given law actually means like uh herder patriots talking about or oh, we, we need more security and more surveillance in public space and against those evil uh, islamist uh, terrorists and what have you and these are exactly the mechanisms that are eventually going to use against right-wing extremists and uh, whatever group that is uh, undesirable at a, any given time very well said. Now, let's turn to you, FC. What... All right. Um, I, you contextualized the text really well, and it's linked to uh, Badiou. But um, allow me to say just a little more about the influences on, um, on Agamben. Because I think that, generally speaking, this is a good text to read. People should take it up. Uh, a lot of interesting ideas here, like Nil said. Uh, this is one, I think, thinker of the left who really does take Schmidt seriously. The way he takes him up doesn't make a caricature out of, uh, out of Schmidt in the way that so many authors of the left have done. Uh, Schmidt is now a big name. There was a big boom in uh, Schmidt studies in the 90s and 2000s. But gen generally speaking, my impression of, you know, modern democratic theorists and so on who, who take up Schmidt is that they're just performing this kind of dance where they're saying, ooh, look, we, you know, we're engaging with a Nazi. You see how fair we are and this is so dangerous. Look at us. Uh, but they don't, they don't really take him up, at, you know, in the fullness of what he has to say, which is not a critique you can make of, of Agamben. Um, that said, uh, Agamben is a theorist of the left. Uh, he, I think, belongs to a kind of counter uh, 
tradition to Marxism, or he's, he's trying to supplement Marxism. He doesn't think uh, the Marxist view of uh, the state and of the state's relation to the individual is, is uh, fully fleshed out, uh, or he, he doesn't think it's sufficient, so he wants to add something to it in the same way that uh, uh, Arendt did. They stand in that kind of tradition in which uh, that, that central European German tradition in which you know, the ancient world and especially Athens is a kind of a live option which they're always returning to, uh, not only as a, as a kind of past projection of what they see as uh, the political system of the West today, but uh, as a, so not just something that we inherit ideas and structures from, but something that we're, we're constantly returning to and trying to crib ideas from. Um, Arendt, uh, for those who, who know something about her, uh, was uh, a German Jewish uh, theorist who escaped kind of just before the Nazis came to power. I think she experienced internment, not in Germany, but in France, uh, in Gers, before she finally escaped to the United States. Uh, Primo Levi was an Italian Jew uh, who was also a, a big influence on Agamben, um, who was an internee at Auschwitz. Uh, and, you know, you see in, in, the, in the imagination of Jewish political theory uh, uh, after the war, this, uh, you know, reasonably enough, this uh, obsession with rights, with belonging, with community, with one's relation to the state and to law, uh, which Agamben takes up in a kind of very interesting way. Uh, in, in Arendt, the way, you know, the way she looks at the state, I mean, her object of study in a way is totalitarianism. She talks about, uh, you know, she talks about a state of exception, you could say, in a, a, a much less generalized way than Agamben does. And uh, I think part of that is that she, she never makes a, a, an honest attempt to engage directly with Schmidt and to speak about these things in a general way. She didn't have any juridical training, I think. So she, she was just talking about politics and history, as it were. Um, but she, she basically, her, her thesis in Origins of Totalitarianism is that uh, the camp, um, the concentration camp, is a kind of a test chamber. It's this kind of opening in the, in the space of state power and law, which allows uh, the totalitarian experience to really come through, to work as an experiment on, on bare human being, on human bodies, on, on what it is to be a being. It breaks down and tries to create this new this new man, this totalitarian uh, subject. And Agamben kind of takes up this idea, generalizes it uh, while taking a lot uh, from uh, Schmidt, uh, and basically says that this is clearly not just the condition of Nazism or, or the Soviet experience, which is what uh, Arendt was referring to, uh, but, you know, as a, as a theorist of postmodernity and as someone who came later, Kind of saw that this is equally a condition that subsists for our democratic reality and democratic states. Uh, one interesting kind of, I think this was a popular episode which brought his name to wider attention. Um, he, he, in the aftermath to 9-11, he was invited to do some lectures in, uh, in America and basically uh, made a uh, a public issue of the fact that he wasn't willing to go uh, because he 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 wouldn't concede to give his uh, biometric security data, which at that time, uh, you know, had kind of become um, uh, was uh, was a legislated necessity of entering the United States. Uh, he he there was this kind of open letter that he penned in which his hopes were quite clearly that uh, other European academics would kind of take up this commitment that they would refuse to travel to and lecture in the United States. I don't think anyone else took him up on the proposition. It was just him. But uh, you, I think you can kind of see in conceits like these, and it, and it does come through in his writing as well, he is a philosopher of the left. Uh, he, he is an interesting one. I, I think he's definitely worth reading. I don't use that as an insult. But ultimately, he does have this concern with the individual as a rights bearer, uh, the individual and his human rights in a way that uh, Schmidt 
Schmidt didn't lay emphasis on that notably. Um, and so I think the way I've kind of tried to contextualize this is he does belong to this alternate tradition uh, on the left, this alternate tradition of thought, this stream which is counter to uh, Marxism or which tries to supplement what it sees as the deficiencies of this, uh, which does try in its own way to make a critique of uh, democracy and of the West uh, as an as an imperfect uh, uh, political system as well. And um, yeah, he's worth, he's definitely worth reading. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, one thing there to harp in on is, I mean, he's certainly not a Marxist and he is certainly concerned with the way you put it, uh, you know, the rights for the individual that he sees as under attack by this exercise of biopolitical power and this giant global concentration camp as he sees it. But the interesting thing about it, I think, is his own answer is not very clear at all because he's describing the structure of the law as a paradox that just comes outside of sovereignty itself and the very existence of sovereign power. So it seems to me he would be committed to at least some form of anarchism or which he takes over from Walter Benjamin, some messi messianic, messianic um, anarchism. And you could see, for example, other texts, I know we didn't talk about those ones, but he deals explicitly with Christian theology and St. Paul and all of them. And this kind of um, what he sees as this resistance against state power within the early church. And so the question I think that's posed to us from reading this text is not a very easy question to answer. And that's just the fact of the exercise of sovereign power and how exactly the construction of law and sovereignty is not going to always give birth to this kind of uh, exercise of sovereignty that he sees throughout this text as so dangerous because he's, he's saying that this is just, you know, he, he's not, this is not just like a moral critique where he's saying, okay, just change the law and then it's all good. He's saying it comes outside the paradox of sovereignty itself. And so the answer to this is just not quite that clear, right? So, I mean, just to turn to Nils, what, what do you think we at least should be taking from his critique? Because there's always going to be, a, at least if we accept his philosophy, there's always going to be this exercise of, sovereignty and this insertion of Zoe into BIOS? Um, oh, well, tough question. Um, I guess it depends on everyone, as we said back in the very first Schmidt episode, to once again make a decision. And uh, it's, it's basically about what you guys or what the, the individual wants to see in a in a human community um one one has to acknowledge that the nation state that we all take for granted nowadays is actually not that old and compared to the history of humanity and what have you um it's it's a rather young phenomenon compared to monarchies and and the early uh, the early theocracies and whatever and all those methods and forms of structuring human community have necessarily always been about the application of power and uh, the 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 formation of a reliable and 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 feasible um, power structure to govern and to lead any given human community and uh, by talking about uh, certain inalienable human rights that are violated by so-called uh, or self-proclaimed democratic governments uh, whether it is within their own nation state or against uh, other nation states like the, the US and EU interventions on the Balkans and uh, later in, in, in the middle, in, <laughs> from your perspective, it's uh, the Middle East from, from 
my European perspective, it's the, the, the Near East. Um, the thing is, we this is this is what what but you uh, criticized in in his ethics. The thing is, um, as Agamemnon points out, if power structures themselves necessarily breed those, uh, let's say, um, mutations of uh, at the very beginning, uh, completely uh, well-meaning structures and and uh, people who created these uh, methods of governing, um, then the most radical but also most helpful way would to do away with those power structures and those methods of governing. But then uh, we would necessarily uh, also do away with uh, any with any structure that holds human community together and this is basically what all uh, those uh, collapsitarians and people who uh, who who took uh, accelerationism to its 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 anti uh, statist and are waiting for that society eventually crumbles and then uh, the way will be free to form something new out of the ashes and, and what have you but uh, the problem is that most people um, are pretty much satisfied with these uh, democracies as they are now i believe uh, to various degrees because we also have various degrees of uh, uh, democracy existing in reality and liberalism and authoritarian democracies and and all those all those different shades of gray and on the other hand um real anarchy hasn't been tried yet i believe uh, besides uh certain certain uh uh crackpot communes in in the 1960s or something like that and all those didn't work out so the question is if agamben's diagnosis is right and the system in itself is flawed from the beginning and uh, there is no way to stop those uh, abominations or whatever you want to call them from occurring within the system then is there any alternative left and if so what is it yeah exactly that's what that's what i, I wanted to get across um, fc how, how would you respond to how me and nils characterize this um, I, I can call, I would just kind of, I, I, I would add that, you know, the difficulty with an author like this is, uh, again, what, what exactly is it that he wants us to put into practice? Uh, one thing that you can definitely say of the Marxists, I, I don't think you can fairly critique them by saying, oh, you don't present an alternative. It, they stand in a tradition which very clearly attempts to think of an alternative in more or less definite terms. Whereas, uh, you know, Agamben, authors like him, but definitely Agamben was open to, uh, open himself to critiques uh, for, for in his professional career from Marxists who basically, and other, and other thinkers of the left who said, yeah, but where is this all going? He has a, a, a term, a term of art, I think he takes over from uh, a few other German theorists of the time, uh, the politics to come, which even just by its name, you can see, I mean, a, a, a politics that doesn't really have a name, a politics that doesn't have a designation. It's, it's, it's like a stand in term. I think one thing you could say of us, uh, if, it, if it's fair to think of us all as, as standing in a sort of tradition on the right, um, is that there is more or less a, a, a kind of acceptance on a, on a moral and aesthetic level that our relation to power is necessarily going to be one that is, uh, you know, exclusionary to some extent. There'll never be a world in which everyone is included into a political structure you know, e even on a, a Gambon's vision, if there was something like a world government, that clearly wouldn't uh, mean that there was no structure of exclusion built into the system itself. And, um, you know, on, on some level, he, I think he, he accurately problematizes the modern condition. And, um, you know, it, he, in that phrase, the, the transition or the, the interpenetration of Athens and Auschwitz, uh, that, you know, there, there, there kind of is no getting away from the fact that 
the modern experience, but but the relation to power more broadly uh, always has this undercurrent that your inclusion, your representation as you know a set of identities in the system and in relation to the state. You are a worker. You are a teacher. You are a boxer. But most importantly, you're you're a, you're a political participant, and for authors like him and Arendt, you're a rights bearer. Ultimately, the 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 subtle line beneath that is that that's really only during a a state of norms, you could say. Even in a, a even in the best system, supposedly best system like democracy, uh, you know, a state of exception is. Uh, a state of exception co kind of coexists with a state of norms, and really, when you re when you're reduced to that, you're nothing but bare you're, you're nothing but bare life. You you don't have rights. You exist on the threshold of the juridical political order, and um, you know whether or not there's a sol he assumes that there's a solution to this problem. A pro that he says you know is is stands under this term the politics to come. Uh, but I don't think he ever gives. A, I don't think he ever really gives a good designation of what that will be. He doesn't really describe it. It does have something to do with a kind of politics of friendship, a politics of love, something radically different from uh, the state relation and state membership and the relationship in which we stand to law today. Um, so I, I mean, that's one thing I, I would say that we could take away from him is uh, a, a good development from the work of Schmidt. I, I think he deepens our understanding of the, the ambiguity of uh, our, our subjecthood uh, and our, our relation to law. But ultimately, uh, yeah, like, like many of these authors of the left, I, I, I'll grant him that he does, he does have more courage than someone like Arendt, who basically kind of says, well, uh, we really need these human rights. We, we we kind of need them to be encoded and defended. I think ultimately she would have been a kind of um, supporter of American imperialism, uh, uh, but I think she died before the '90s, before this experiment came to a kind of full uh, fruition. The idea of uh, humanitarian intervention abroad for, on the basis of human rights. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean. The, the, there is this kind of ambiguity. He, he doesn't give a solution. Maybe in a way, given that he's an he, given that he's a thinker of the left, it, it represents a kind of bravery on his part that he's willing to say, "Well, I, I kind of don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. I've problematized this for you. I've deepened our understanding." Uh, but you know, I, it, I think it's fair to say you know, Marxists made this critique of him. I think we can definitely say the same. What alternative do you present? And do you really think there's a, there's an alternate relation in which we can stand to the state, to power, uh, that doesn't ultimately rest on a kind of subjection, not on the just the need for obedience, which is one way this has been conceptualized, but yes, that we we, we will never just be by us. There's there's this undercurrent of bare life, which uh, which is the substrate, you know, which in which the state stands in relation to us when things go wrong, so to speak. But on the other hand, isn't this kind of part of the the so-called postmodern condition that that uh, there are no real solutions and that uh, m most uh, postmodern philosophers and and intellectuals more or less just point out uh, how everything is going downhill. Or has been going downhill for years and decades from now on, and where it might possibly end, but that there is no actual way to to stop it from rolling on. Right. Yeah. I think I think that's I think that's fair to say. Uh, we. I mean, we would definitely have to turn to different thinkers and philosophical traditions to kind of uh, think a politics of the future, because thinkers like this. Who ultimately, this is the case with Agamben. It's the case with uh, Arendt. Uh, probably the case with Levy. You know, ultimately their politics is a bourgeois politics. They 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 might have they might problematize this relation. They might see that there are hidden uh, hidden monstrosities and velleities 
beneath the substrate of liberalism and capitalism. That's definitely the, sorry, uh, liberalism and uh, democracy. That's definitely the case with the Gambon. Uh, but what is supposed to stand in? They, they, I, ultimately, I don't think they, they say anything. They, they don't think a form of power that is uh, radically different because there, there is no form of power that's radically different. There's, uh, there's anarchy, which, you know, they, they might have, they might adopt, adopt different poses towards, but uh, which, you know, for different reasons, none of them actually suggest it as a solution for obvious reasons. Right. Well, I mean, we could, like, for example, a Gombin, I, I don't mean to get outside this particular text, but I'll have to. But in his answer to this, he takes a look at uh, monasticism. So he studies, you know, the Christian monks and all that. And what he's trying to get at is that they have this relationship to the law in which it appears that the law regulates all right down to every aspect of their life. This, all the smallest details of their life is regulated by the law. But the monastics themselves conceive of this relation to a law as rules that form and shape your life in such a way that um, it provide it, instead of like a secular law, which provides very strict um, boundaries on and a strict division in that it brings you into this relation to the law that it's very prohibitive and it's very much if you transgress this law then you know your rights are immediately taken away you're reduced to this being that can be killed but then under the monastics at least as a gambin sees it he sees that this law shapes life in such a way that it is changing the modes of how we conceive of life in the political as a whole and how we conceive of life outside the political because the important thing to remember in Agamben is that he starts with this distinction between Zoe and Bios, specifically to say that the modes of how we conceiving conceive life is what's going to play a, a role in how we shape law and how we order our politic, right? So it, it's not just a matter of, um, by necessity, the exercise of law in general is going to necessarily lead to this global state that he's describing, right? It's, it's more or less that he's talking about very specific forms of life that are taken up in modernity. So it seems to me the question would be, how do we reshape and how do we conceive of life and its relation to the law in a way that's different from global liberalism? Because we've talked before about uh, when we examined uh, uh, Day Loses uh, Societies of Control and how, you know, could... And, and as opposed to the disciplinary societies where you're clocked into a very particular place like factory or the prison or the home and it's very regimented with all their rules, what we have now is a society of control where that method of control exercises control in a way that's rather omnipotent. It's in, within all matters of life in the sense that there's no escaping it. And so it seems what they're trying, what at least we're trying to get at here is a new way of describing a system that would account for the forms of life and distinguish between uh, the home and the private and the political sphere, but not in a way that reproduces the secular neutrality of private versus public, which is very much a part of that same liberal neutral functioning that it that gives it its metaphysical weight. It gives it its ontological weight. So I think that's the the message of the book is about these specific uh, conceptualizations of form of life under modernity and how it includes both of them precisely that it can reduce you to the status of bare life. Do you have a response to that? Or because I mean, it's it's not just that it's um, this you know the exercise of power it's going to lead exactly to the state that we have now, but it's a very specific way in which law and life is ordered that leads us to where we are now. And I guess to rephrase this question then, and why I picked uh, these people as responses to Schmidt when we're here to do this series on Schmidt, is because do we ever really escape Schmidt's critique? I, that's a question that I think we have to ask. 
And do any of these thinkers escape that critique? I, I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you want to go first now, Zora? All right. Um, I mean, uh, I don't think they really escape his critique. I, I might say, in light of something, um, in light of something that was said on the Derrida stream, one of them anyway. One thing you cannot say of Schmidt is that he is not a basically a total master of the implications of what he says, uh, which is a critique that you definitely can make of someone like a Gambon. And without just reiterating what you know what we've basically been saying, which is that he doesn't give a solution. I mean, he I think he seizes on uh, he seizes on something that is certainly correct. This weird, sacred nature of power, how it operates, uh, our relation to, you know, what what, what Adam Katz calls uh, a center, and what Derrida also thought of as a center, um, that, that, you know, true to, you know, true to Schmidt as well, he grasped that this is something that both stands within a system, it's part of that system, and it isn't part of that system. It must stand outside, it must stand uh, above, I don't mean that in a in a transcendental sense, uh, but you know it stands outside or above a system uh, precisely in order to give a structure to it. it. You know precisely in order to affect a change. You could say, uh, you know this the, the the way that various anthropologists, but Katz as well, have thought of sacral kingship uh, is something that you know. I think we can actually discuss on the next stream when we when we talk more about Homo Seca, what it is to stand in this in this strange position of a being who uh, who you know is under the ban of sovereignty uh, in the sense that you know they they can be killed and and no one no one will be punished for it. Their their death doesn't constitute an event like murder. It's an event of a of a wholly different kind. Um, but who cannot be sacrificed? Who, who, uh, who? The, you know, various ways you can cognize this is who is unclean or who is unsuitable or who has been cast outside of a system but is still retained by it. This is the ambiguity that Agamben captures well, uh, that Schmidt kind of doesn't remark on, uh, but that I think we can take further as a critique of what it is to stand in relation to a center, how a center actually uh, emits or issues imperatives. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think Agamben problematizes it well enough. I believe there's, there's, uh, there's a lot to this, especially because of this, this trope of the inclusion by exclusion that Agamben uh, brings forward in a in a very poignant way because uh, if we if we look at the ancient human communities in in in, in greece and in rome uh, in the ancient greek law even before its uh codification during the the solon era in athens i believe um by looking at the system of uh of punishments and the 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 the, uh, the crimes that that uh, were the basis for that, at least as far as we know now, largely relying on writings by Plato and and others, um, the uh, the defendant was usually seen or the the, the, the polis as a whole, as a as a uh, as a community of the political men within it, um, regarding the the bios here, of course, was seen as a body politics in a quite literal sense, as a living and breathing political being, and thus the the uh, the criminal was seen as some sort of uh, rogue cell that would create cancer or some some uh, some. Uh, some virus from outside and uh, handled in 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 <laughs> the appropriate ways and one very very distinct um example where this can be seen is in 
the apology of, of Socrates, where the uh, where the hemlock that Socrates has to drink to fulfill his own death sentence is, uh, at least as far as I recall it, not a single time called by its actual um, name for hemlock that would be koinon, but is always called pharmakon. So the, it is it is called a medicine or a remedy for this uh, this this condition that uh, has uh, befallen the political body. This uh, hubris that they convicted Socrates for, and that must now be healed by killing the evildoer. And uh, this more or less more or less also applies to this inclusion by exclusion because uh, one who is considered a, a homo sacer is not a citizen anymore but he is still a human being and from perspective where every human being uh, is sacred in and of its own uh, it must not be sacrificed because that in itself would be a sacrilege so he can be killed because he is no longer a citizen um otherwise the the sovereign who guarantees for the safety of uh, his underlings his citizens would contradict himself or itself but uh, he must not be sacrificed because uh, he is a sacred being in and of itself and this would anger the gods whereas they would uh look down upon the killing of a a uh, criminal former citizen with, uh, oh, well, with with disinterest. You know, I like that you brought up the word pharmacon. Actually, that's where the word pharmacy comes from. Meaning, uh, right. it's a poison and a cure at the same time. That actually says a lot. <laughs> it's one of my favorite uh, Greek words. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? Because because uh, just to say this right now, is I mean the the logic of the exclusive inclusive and the distinction between Zoe and Bios and the paradox of sovereignty, we have pretty much covered. So I'll, I'll, so the points that Mill was getting into is actually the beginning of the second part of the book, which I mean, we're very limited in what we can say because we're, we're going to cover the second and last part of the book. So it's so that pretty much, I think we ran through the intro, unless there's anything you want to bring up FC, because I know there's, one other thing we didn't co cover that was the uh, potentiality and the law between the constituting law and constituted law is there anything there you wanted to bring up or anything else you wanted to add uh yeah before before you kind of bring up laura and because you brought up uh, you brought up this dual nature of uh, of medicine and um medicine and poison i mean uh medicine and poison is one way of conceptualizing our relation to the state and to the, the the plane of eminence that we're actually you know situated in because if, if you think about an example if you think about a, a concrete example like say uh, we'll try not to bring this up too much uh, in future streams but the coronavirus and 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 China's response to it and so on um, basically the 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 bourgeois the, the 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 liberal critique of china is it treat it treats its citizens even in times of relative peace and so on as livestock this is the problem with any system but liberalism where uh, you don't very specifically inscribe rights you could say the, where you don't actually treat every individual as a as a, a center of moral worth and autonomy and so on and where their relationship to power isn't perfectly inscribed in law uh, isn't fully represented in various institutions and so on uh, but of course you know that that description really is a description of a that description is a description of a state of norms which uh, precisely fails to have application when the rubber hits the road and when things go wrong um, the the way to the way to cognize our, our relationship to power, our relationship to to the center, I don't think we tend, you know, 
the the examples that jump to mind and the examples that liberals are solely interested in are bad examples. When something goes wrong in the sense of an, an epidemic or a war or civil war or strife or unrest, uh, and so you know the 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 response of them, the necessary response of power and of the state, which is to animalize us in some sense. You know, what do you do with people who are uh, very sick and contagious? I mean, you you quarantine them, you put them in a camp in order to ensure the, the security of the rest of the population. This is normal. Any state would respond this way. Every state does respond this way, including liberal democratic ones. So so this is a this is a critique that they actually directed themselves as well in a way, uh, but that ultimately, I mean, what what do they suggest? What alternate what alternate conceptualization of our relationship to the center, and of the center's relationship to us, and that and its responsibility, you could say, to to issue imperatives to to actually uh, secure the system uh, to 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 give it you know its own kind of life what what alternative is there to this uh they they certainly cannot conceptualize this i think one way of uh one way which was brought up on the derrida stream of uh of considering this of thinking about sovereignty is certainly not just this thing that intrudes on us in in a negative abstract sense when things go wrong but it power power to prescribe, power to put us under a ban, power to reduce us to animals when it is necessary to do so, is also the power to ennoble us in a way. It's also the power to give us, um, to, to, to defer and to, to give us a space of, uh, of, crea of creativity in fulfilling the demands of the state. Sovereignty is a kind of creativity too, uh, a cr the creativity of the highest kind. Uh, and this is one thing that really falls through in the liberal critique, uh, which puts law at, at the center of everything. Uh, except I, this is one thing that we might actually be able to talk about next week. Uh, but, you know, when law falls away, liberals always regard that as a problem. Uh, but it, it need not always be a problem. It, it can actually be an opportunity of, of, a, of a positive kind. So yeah, if you if you then wanted to take the discussion into the well, I was, I was just going to say, this is the way you put that is what I wanted to get to. Is that um, right. what I was trying to get to earlier? Is that through reading this engagement with Agamben to Schmidt, is now we're just right back at Schmidt's initial points in the first place. I mean, you talked about uh, the critique of China by American liberal democracy, where they say, oh, you're reducing them to humans. This is horrible. This is terrible. But that is exactly. Schmidt's critique of the universalizing language of liberalism, where if someone invokes humanity, they want to cheat and they want to obscure their own exercise of power. And then you get back to, okay, well, the creative effort of power, this effort of the sovereign to configure and decide on this state of exception, you've just brought us right back full circle to Schmidt again. And so this is what I was getting at earlier. Is there any sense in which these authors, even though they deepen our relation with Schmidt, it seems that they ultimately they circle back to Schmidt's original point, his original points that motivated him to write the tracks that he did. And that, that's one thing I keep getting out of reading these various uh, critiques of Schmidt. But it's certainly true that Agamben takes him up in a far more interesting way than Derrida, although Derrida's way is, I think, dangerous. As I elaborate on the Derrida stream, I won't go into that again. But uh, yeah, as Nils, is there anything you want to comment on that? Uh, I believe one reason for this uh, for this phenomenon of uh, usually anti-reactionary and anti-authoritarian uh, thinkers still circling back to Schmidt is that one of Schmidt's major attacking points uh, that is usually um, overlooked because of of the the real political uh, implications of his works is his struggle against uh, the theory of positive rights and or positive law and um, all those uh, liberal and free thinking and left-wing uh, intellectuals necessarily are also positioned against positive law because positive law is 
inherently amoral and uh, harking back to the experiences of uh, authoritarian and totalitarian governments in uh, the 20th century, no left-wing or liberal or free-thinking or moderate or what have you intellectual would possibly uh, side with positive law because um, it, it was it was used as a tool at the beginning of the 20th century and especially especially during the interwar period schmidt talks uh about this at length in in the second chapter of political theology especially his his uh his old rival um um hans kelsen who uh, crafted the uh, constitution of austria after the 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 breaking up of the austro-hungarian empire uh post world war one um and and back then kelsen said this is the constitution and this is the end of all reasoning the constitution says this and this and this should be law so it must be law and there's no questioning it and schmidt positions his questions uh, against this and he says well does that mean that this constitution was not crafted by a human being, by you? Is, is this not uh, a valid point to make? Because um, no constitution can be perfect and someone has to be blamed. And if you just say it's, it's criminal from now on to question the constitution, as the situation is more or less in, in, in Germany uh, since... Uh, post 1945 and when the the federal republic was founded in in, in 1949 um is still does not make this constitution unquestionable people just won't do it in the open and uh questions that might be um questions that might be uh really visceral ones and may concern the existence of the state uh, or at least the political system as it is uh, might not be asked while well, there would still be time to react to them. This is the problem with positive law and uh, because Schmidt was positioned against this and a lot, if not most of his, his, of his theoretical work in the end uh, works against this while it might be clad in some some uh, ambiguous uh, political uh, theoretical way, uh, most nowadays and 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 uh, in, as well as as nowadays most uh, most radical uh, system questioning thinkers, usually found on the left, uh, even in the sixties and seventies, would circle back to Schmidt because he was the most outspoken and uh, most uh, most most brilliant anti-positive law thinkers of the 20th century I believe very well said well I think that's a good point to leave it on because we've covered I think the first part of this text so we have to save the rest for part two see so is there anything you wanted to say before we wrap this up um, maybe just one more thing at the, at the kind of risk of repeating myself, but let me, but let me circle back around to where I started in my remarks about, uh, uh, Arendt and my comparison between her and, and Agamben. There is a risk, I think, uh, that if you want to be a rigorous thinker, it doesn't matter whether it's in the discipline of philosophy or uh, as Schmidt stood, Schmidt was uh, obviously educated as a, as a lawyer and a jurist, um, but moved into, naturally moved into a kind of political theory because he, unlike most lawyers, was, ended up being honest enough to see that law is ultimately something that's uh, subordinate to power. There must be an establishing act. There must be a sovereign. There must be someone who decides on the exception and that law has no meaning without decision either, precisely because, you know, again, I think this is a mark of the fairness of Schmidt's thought. He, he was a Catholic, uh, kind of sort of during the time that this, these, uh, these reflections started to come up for him. 
whether or not he was a Catholic afterwards or how what he really believed is a is a difficult question. But still, uh, you know, after his twenties, he he was properly able to 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 have a kind of rigorous analysis of these kinds of things while still being a master of the implications of of what he was saying. Uh, the risk with an author like uh, Arendt, many authors of the left, in fact, certainly with uh, Agamben too, is that though they have interesting things to say, uh, when they try to be systematic, uh, they, 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 they suffer from a kind of radical failure, which can only be papered over in the end by suggesting something, you know, by giving a name to that which they won't describe, the idea of a politics to come, or in a rent, you know, the way she, <laughs> the, the hopeful note on which she ends origins, of totalitarianism is with this uh, theory, you could say, of natality, which is, which is basically that you know after this book in which she she goes through the the incredibly horrible, the the horrible relation of of man and state in the twentieth century. Ultimately, look, uh, totalitarianism can't last forever because new human beings are always born, and so this this terrible experiment of the camp. Uh, this this attempt to make a new totalitarian subject, this you know, this 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 bare thing, this thing without a bios, you could say, uh, that it's ultimately going to be unsuccessful because you you have this resurgence of of pure difference, you know, even on the level of uh, of 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 individuals of of the birth of the human and the rebirth of the human. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is this is one critique I think we could carry forward, and one thing we could bear in mind. Uh, Schmidt, for all his flaws, I think there are critiques one could make of him. Uh, you know, he held in mind all the implications of what he wanted to say. He was he was incredibly harsh, uh, even with himself during the later parts of his career. Uh, for you know, parts of his parts of his cognizing and parts of his analysis that didn't fit. Uh, whereas this is something that uh, thinkers of the left, especially those who have taken up Schmidt, have a, a serious difficulty with. This is their this is their main deficiency. I think it will come through even more next week when we're discussing uh, Homo Sacer as a as a figure. Perfect note to end it on. All right, guys. Well, we'll see you next week. We are doing part two and three of this work, and that will conclude the Schmidt series. And like I said, ECL next week will be canceled because the new mic's on the way, but luckily for next weekend, for this show, all the production qualities will increase. So thank you for watching, and good to have you here, Nils, and always good to see you, FZ. Take care. Always a pleasure. See ya. See ya.